when you see Western central banks blowing their currency apart like they are with just never-ending borrowing, gold is going to shine, and it's finally having its day. So I guess we should have expected this for a while now. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for September 23rd through September 30th, 2024, while supplies last. First, we feature the one-ounce gold Argor Horaeus Dragon Bar at just $69 over spot. Next, the 2024 one-ounce silver American Eagle is just $5.25 over spot, the lowest premium in months. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Hey, everyone. This is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is Tony Greer from TJMacro.com. Tony, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Elijah. How are you doing, man? Fantastic. Well, we've had uh, quite a ride in metals here uh, over this, you know, pretty much this whole year, gold skyrocketing. It's still at all-time highs around 2660 as we speak. Your perspective on the precious metal markets uh, we've seen this year. I've been bullish, you know, came into the year bullish and long gold. And um, gold seems to be responding to, you know, a number of different stimuli right now. You know, we, we've got central bank buying. Um, you know, you've got runaway U.S. debt levels with, you know, runaway interest on U.S. debt levels. So we're kind of financing burning fiat currency with more burning fiat currency. And I think that's why gold gets into this positive loop. Um, you know, you can see other Western countries doing the same thing. And, um, you know, really just that theory of kind of blowing apart fiat currency at the expense of gold. So those vibes keep getting stronger and stronger and there's more and more, you know, international buying. And, you know, so there we are at a new all time high. You know, gold is in the mode right now where the breakout is starting to run. I wouldn't doubt that the pace continues for a while until it gets, you know, to a level where more people are talking about it. But right now, you know, nobody really is talking about the price of gold trading all time highs other than like the gold bug buggy type of people. So I think until that sentiment goes from being, you know, nowhere on the radar screen to being way, way overbought and totally saturated, we're going to be in for quite a ride to come in gold. I think it gets to 3000 in pretty short order. So we'll see what happens. Do you have a time frame on that when you're expecting 3000? Well, I think, you know, it's starting to go up faster the farther it goes up. And I am expecting there to be some kind of an actual chase to get into the gold markets at some point. I think that, you know, it's starting to make more and more sense for portfolio managers to potentially, you know, adjust their allocations to gold and to gold miners and things like that. So, you know, I think that that's what we're moving towards in the markets and that type, that type of a phenomenon. So time frame to get to 3K probably happens in the first half of next year, if not sooner. You know, that's kind of what I'm thinking. And, and, you know, who knows? It might still be in great shape when it gets there. It might be a little bit overextended. But, you know, I'm trying not to pick a number and I'm trying to just stay with gold in terms of, you know, kicking the tires on making sure that it's still the right position to be in. And, you know, as long as we continue to, you know, pile on our national debt and pile on the financing of it and central banks keep buying and, you know, there's a lot of reasons to stay with gold right now. Like there's a lot of reasons to stay with alternate currencies like Bitcoin and things like that. It's just a, when you see Western central banks blowing their currency apart like they are with just never ending borrowing, gold is going to shine and it's finally having its day. So I guess we should have expected this for a while now. I did want to ask you about the stock market because I know last time we had you on, you were very bullish on stocks. Um, and I know recently you've been a bit more cautious, especially over the summer. So where uh, where are you in the general stock market and also when it comes to the tech stocks? So that's well framed. You know, I was I've been an S&P bull since November of last year. Um, I sold out of the position in July of this year, very close to the market top the first time. 
Um, so that was around, you know, probably at these levels. And really, I'm kind of getting back to being bullish again, quite honestly. You know, we've lived through two major scares recently in the stock market. Essentially, we lived through, we had that triple whammy where there was the yen carry unwind. There was the NVIDIA bubble beginning to unwind. And there was the curve steepening um, that knocked the S&P down to 5,100 you know, at the lows, and then the market shot right back to the highs and backed off again as we went into this growth scare, right? Economic growth scare, China, big slowdown, big slowdown here in the U.S., and we experienced some volatility with that as the Fed pivoted toward a big easing cycle. And so, you know, there was reason to be concerned that the beginning of the easing cycle might have meant the top of the market since we were raising rates and the market was going along with it, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, you worried about a sell the fact event. And now the market's lived through that. It's gotten back on its feet. You know, technology has stabilized. We're seeing a lot of commodities and commodity space type of moves happening where they're coming to life now and kind of catching up on the year. So it's hard to stay, it's hard to be neutral even in the stock market when all of a sudden cyclicals are performing and tech is performing and rates are going lower. And I think like, you know, if you listen to the Traders Almanac guys, you know, the Fed has cut rates with the stock market at all time highs 21 times now with the last time being the 21st. And I think 12 months later, all 20 times stocks are higher. So you know, we kind of live through all the sell the fact events, the market, the S&P is doing its job, sorting out winners and losers and coming out on top. And, you know, if we pop through this old, you know, high point of the range at around 57, 60 or 70, you know, through there, the stock market should run to 6K. You know, there's been a lot of consolidating for several months now and a break at the top of the range should mean a move to a higher range. So that's kind of what I'm looking for into the end of the year. And how do you uh, see the Fed impacting all of this? You mentioned how cutting rates, uh, in your view, is bullish for the stock market. Well, I, you know, I like my view was that was I wanted to see what happened. You know, I wanted to see whether the Fed cut twenty five or fifty. I wanted to see how the market reacted to that. And there were some initial reactions that indicated there might have been a change in the trends that were going on, like there was a reversal in the dollar and a reversal in gold. Um, you know, the dollar reversed higher, gold reversed lower on the day of the FOMC. So you thought that that could have been the end of the trends that were running for such a long time, or at least for the several months prior. And the trends took right over the next day, meaning the dollar index turned and went back down again. Gold turned and took made a new high two days later after the reversal day. So that was the trends taking over in my opinion. And so it feels like a kind of similar thing can happen in stocks where, you know, we're getting through this uncertainty period of how dovish the Fed is going to be. And we got the first rate cut and it's turning out that the market is holding in just fine. So my idea is that we're probably going to resume the rally that we were in for the first several months of the or middle part of the year. No, when it comes to uncertainty, obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty with respect to the election. Uh, your perspective regarding the unpredictability of the election, and do you see that an outcome, a particular outcome, would be more bullish or bearish for the markets? You know, I, I'm a firm believer that the polls being even remotely close right now is a psyop. You know, I, I don't believe for a moment that. Kamala Harris has got the same odds of being elected president with no track record and no policies whatsoever, almost other than sort of constrictive Soviet style communist policies. So I think that that would be an actual disaster for the stock market. I think the S&P could go down 30 percent if she gets elected. Um, you know, she's talking about running on a platform of, you know, censorship and authoritarianism and taxing unrealized gains and things like that. And you know, if those even get a breath of air, that's an absolute disaster for the stock market, right? There's just there's nothing to talk about. You just have to think about it, right? What are people going to do with the assets that they have if they're forced to pay taxes on unrealized gains? They're going to sell them. Nobody wants to pay all those taxes and have to worry about the math year in and year out. So 
that's a big hit to capitalism, if you ask me. Um, and I don't think that the market believes that she's going to win, judging from the way that it's going to be, be behaving. Um, I think the market probably believes, sees the truth a little closer that Donald Trump is probably a much clearer front runner since the economy did great and the stock market did great while he was in office. And, you know, he's going to do all the things that are probably good for the stock market, like drill, baby, drill and keep interest rates low. And God knows what could happen with the S&P if he gets elected again. Obviously, everybody's just wondering if the margin of victory is going to be big enough to steal the election, you know, or, or that's not going to be possible. So I think that the market's telegraphing a Trump victory. I think a Trump victory would be very bullish. I think it'll rock the oil market initially. Um because I do think gas prices and oil prices will come down under the Trump administration. But I think that the stocks are probably set up to do very well in terms of generating solid earnings and outperforming earnings. So I think that maybe in energy stocks, there's a dip that you can buy and those stocks wind up doing well by the time the market gets back on its feet kind of thing. So a little bit of a mixed bag there. Definitely. And it seems like right now, a lot of people are saying that we could be in a recession uh, and they're expecting a recession to be announced here soon. And, you know, in the next couple of quarters, your take on that, do you buy uh, that narrative? And also, do you, do you think if Trump is elected, then kind of we're out out of the woods here? No concern of a recession. Yeah, I'm not a recession chaser. Right. And I'm also not an economist. So take what I say about the economy with a grain of salt. But I feel like the Fed has done a great job managing expectations, and if they want to get ahead of any weakness that they're seeing in the economy, they may have already managed you know, the worst of the economy before our eyes, at least in terms of what kind of interest rate cuts we're expecting and how dovish the pivot has been. So since they're really good at managing expectations, I'm going to guess that they probably manage expectations lower kind of beyond where they need to be on the economy so that they're kind of upside surprises for the market to celebrate, you know, and, you know, in my opinion, like we had the recession and it was like long, long, long ago when we had like those two negative quarters of GDP growth in a row during the Biden administration. And, you know, that's what the bond market has historically called a recession. And we saw it and it was over. And that's when everybody in the world and like economists were like, well, we can't really call that a recession, you know, because it was a bad look for Biden. So the reality was the recession happened. The yield curve was inverted a long time and ahead of it and a long time after it. And now that the yield curve is steepening again, you know, that's been associated with volatility in the markets. And we've seen the volatility in the markets kind of living through the steepening. So that to me is, you know, saying as long as the economy doesn't come completely undone from here, that the S&P might be able to hang in there, you know, given we, we, a weaker economy and change in policy by the Fed towards easing. And if the Fed is going to address it with lower interest rates, the economy is going to stay on its feet. And so is the market. That's, I think, what they're trying to accomplish and probably what they'll get. Now, can you maybe share with our viewers a bit more regarding your philosophy of the stock market? Because I know a lot of the guests we have on say that the stock market is fundamentally overvalued. And you kind of, I believe last time we had you on, you were saying that really looking at the fundamentals is not necessarily what you do or think that is relevant, but more on um, the technicals, if I'm getting you right, but feel free to correct anything I said there. But your your view on the stock market being way too overvalued to buy right now. Yeah, I'm not like a value investor. Um, like I said, I'm a trader. So I really don't care about price to earnings multiples and things like that. I think those get people caught up in trying to sound smart. When the reality is that, you know, trading last sale and price action and technical breakouts and momentum and pattern recognition is really how I make my money, you know, so it's um, I, I can stay bullish the stock market because the stock market does unbelievable things technically. Right. We had a steep sell off to the 200 day moving average. Then we had a less steep sell off to the 100 day moving average. So the S&P was carving higher lows. And now here we are back at the highs after those two events, which is what you would expect. And if you would expect it to break through the recent highs after making higher lows and holding those moving average support levels like I do and like any technician should in a bull market, I would expect it to continue higher again. And so, you know, if you want to get caught up in what you think 
the market is deciding the stock market is worth and putting a top number on that and saying, okay, it's not going to be worth any more because we're at this value level. Go ahead, but you're probably not going to make any money. You know what I mean? Like you're probably not going to see things breaking out and be able to go with them and things like that because you're thinking the stock market is fully valued. And there you are putting yourself at a disadvantage in a bull market, which can go on way longer than anybody would ever believe. You know, and that's what we're in the middle of now. So it's like, you know, if the S&P is built to survive, you know, all these economic trials and tribulations and higher rates and lower rates and this and that, it's doing just that. So I don't really have much use for valuation and things like that. I did want to ask you also about a little bit more about the metals markets here. Uh, we touched on gold, your perspective on silver as well. I know silver has you know sustained above thirty dollars here a bit, uh, touched again thirty two. Um, do you have? Are you bullish right now for silver? Is that a completely different animal in your view? Completely different animal, quite honestly. I mean, it wants to tag along as a precious metal, and it may, it just may, especially if gold stays this strong. But to me, the game is about staying in gold because of the destruction of fiat currency. I mean, silver is obviously, you know, a precious metal. It's very much, though, become an industrial metal as well, you know, with the, with the use in, in solar panels and things like that. So it's kind of a hybrid metal to me. If you want to trade silver, make sure you're trading it for the right reasons. If you're buying silver because gold is going up, and you expect silver has to go up a like amount or on a similar trajectory, I would be very careful with that line of thinking. Um, you know, they're not the same exact commodity. They don't have the same characteristics. They don't have the same type of, they don't really have the same players in the markets. So yeah, silver may go along for the ride because it's a precious metal, but I'm sticking with the gold trade and silver is just kind of a noise, uh, you know, have a kind of a noise cancellation policy because it really is, a rich, rich man's casino and at any time during this bull run in precious metals or say let's put it this way at any time during this never-ending bear raid on fiat currency at no point would i expect the bottom to fall out of gold whereas at no point would i be shocked at all if the bottom fell out of silver you know, while we're in this this uh, mode here where, you know, we're running up our national debt, central banks are buying gold, the Saudis are trying to secretly buy gold. You know, while we're in this positive flywheel for gold and precious metals, I w it wouldn't shock me if I woke up one morning and silver was 15 bucks an ounce instead of 32, right? And everybody was like, oh, my God, what happened? And like the answer would be like, of course that happened. It's not gold. It's not the same thing. It doesn't have the same support for it as the gold market. So, you know, that's just one of my kind of philosophies, having been around trading those metals for my entire career. We definitely do see more volatility in silver. And yeah, the bottom can definitely be taken away. I mean, silver can bl plunge overnight, as you mentioned. Are, are the reasons you think kind of because it's more of an industrial metal and also there's not that um, big central bank buying uh, in the same way or? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, if China's buying gold, I want to be long gold. You know, they're, they're buying gold. They're not buying basketballs, right? I didn't get long basketballs. If they said they were buying basketballs, I would get long basketballs. But they never said they were buying silver, you know, because silver is not the trade. So that's kind of how I look at it. So I'm not buying silver at all. I, I don't even care what it does. I, could, I don't even go, care if it goes to 50. I'm not buying it then. If it goes to 25, I'm not buying it then. If it goes back to $5 where it was when I came into the metals markets, that's a place I would buy it. Um, but other than that, I have no interest in owning silver at any price at all. I think that maybe gets back to kind of looking at things as they are right now, rather than how things have behaved in the past or looking at the fundamentals. You're kind of just kind of looking maybe as a realist, you could say, or saying, you know, this, this is how silver is acting right now. Maybe more of an industrial model, not a, not a safe haven. Yeah. I mean, I feel like you're, you know, kind of posing the question as like silver is a precious metal and it's going to go up with gold. Right. And my answer to that is no. Why would you think that? You know what I mean? Like that, that's like, it's like saying the price of lumber is going to go up because gold is going up, right? It's going to because it's a commodity. And you would say like, so what? 
like why am I comparing gold with silver, with lumber, with cocoa? Right. So that's how I'm looking at it. You're comparing apples and oranges and I don't want to compare them and you do. <laughs> yeah, I guess the reason I compare them is because of the history, right, of silver being used as money. But it sounds like that has fundamentally shifted in the last, you know, half century or so. Do we use any money to make solar panels? You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, there's a little bit of gold that goes into industrial use, but it's largely a precious metal. I don't think you can say the same about silver, where some of it goes into industrial use, but it's largely a precious metal. That's not true about silver at all, right? It is largely an industrial metal now. I mean, I think that's where the majority of the ounces that are mined go towards, um, much less towards jewelry and, and, you know, into bar creation for wealth preservation and things like that. So I just don't look, I mean, they're both metal. That's fine. And they're both on the periodic table. That's also fine, but I don't look at them in the same thing in the same light at all. Well, we really do appreciate that. I think it's very important to get uh, diverse perspectives on the channel and definitely a lot of people are bullish silver, but you know, I mean, it's, it's always good to kind of reevaluate our own positions there. I did want to maybe uh, take a step back then look into the end of the year. What are some of the things that you'll be looking for? Obviously there's the election going on, um, but best ways for our viewers to stay aware of what is happening in the markets and also prepare accordingly. Well, I'm, I, you know, the big axe that I've had to grind in the last couple of weeks is that commodities are going from extremely offered and thrown out like the baby with the bathwater to they're morphing into a phase where they're going to be really well bid during a Fed easing period, a weak dollar period. And nobody is positioned for that right now. In fact, I think they're other, the other way where there are still probably big shorts out there in a lot of base metals and in the energy space because everybody's re expecting a recession. And now that we've got the Fed on an easing path to combat that and China on a stimulus path to combat that, if you're still looking for that you know, economic weakness to unfold, I think you're now looking in the wrong direction. You know, because it's getting the address that it needs from central banks and the effect of expecting all of that weakness is already all over the tape. You know, I mean, oil went from 85 to 65 in from June 1st to, you know, the last couple of months. You know, there is the economic divot priced in right there. So if you think that it's going further from there, even with China stimulus and U.S. easing, we need we need that view in the market so so people can express an opposite view but i don't think that that view works out fantastic well tony we really appreciate your time today as always if our viewers are interested in learning more where can they find you yeah i'm at tgmacro.com i'm at tgmacro at twitter um my podcast goes out on tgmacro at substack.com with jared dillian the macro dirt podcast you can sign up for that for free and that's it that's it elijah that's where we are Fantastic. Uh, Tony, thank you so much for your time and God bless. Thanks for having me, man. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and these are the Miles Franklin Weekly Specials for September 23rd through September 30th, 2024, while supplies last. First, we feature the one ounce gold Argor Horaeus Dragon Bar at just $69 over spot. Next, the 2024 one ounce silver American Eagle is just $5.25 over spot, the lowest premium in months. To order our specials or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1 888 81 Liberty. That's 1 888 815 4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you.